Hey all you people out there in YouTube land, we got a different treat for you today. Uh, we're going to be looking at um, a handgun in some detail, but I won't be disassembling this one. It will be mainly the history and the, the, the interest of it. So what are we going to be looking at today is the big question everyone wants to know. Well, we're going to World War II this time, and technically we're starting a little bit earlier than that. But this pistol is from World War II, and that's what we're going to be looking at. So let's have a preview. So, most of you will recognize this as a handgun. Those of you who don't, um, I would suggest maybe not watching this video. So, we're looking at uh, a Smith & Wesson. You might be able to read it off the barrel. You might not be able to, depending on how big the screen you're looking at is. So this, um, if you want to have a guess, you can guess probably several different things, but you can um, guess the M&P 1905, which it is. You can guess the Model 10, which it is. You can also guess the Victory, which specifically is what this one is. So this is a Smith & Wesson Victory model. It's based off of the M&P 1905, which was originally designed in 1899. So this was essentially produced a Victory model uh, in this form without the... Um, really what separated part as Victory is there's a V um, marking on the bottom here that would identify it as a victory model. So, production technically started in 1905 on this model unchanged. Uh, it went to 1942. They built approximately 937,000 of these things, so they're not exactly small. Um, this one probably weighs a little bit less than 28 ounces. Um, this, the barrel length will vary quite a bit, um, but the victory models were set uh, around 1942 uh, sorry, not 1942. Yeah, around 1942 with, with the uh, five inch barrel, which this one has here. So, a six and a half inch barrel would weigh 28 ounces. Um, the overall length is for a six and a half inch one is 11.25 millimeters. Uh, the width um, being measured at the cylinder is 1.4357 inches. That's rather specific. Um, but hey, that's what the internet says. The height from here to here is going to be 4.75 inches uh, it's based off of the K frame um, and this would be the third version of the hand ejector so when I say hand ejector the way you would unload this is you push forward and you swing the cylinder out and to eject you use your hand so I'm gonna pause not pause I'm gonna do a divergent little trip right there to show you um, a little bit about the history now. So the history of this was, this was built for World War II and it was built as an inexpensive, easy to manufacture product. And it was mainly built under request to supplement these guys here. This is an Enfield uh, number one Mark II. Not to start because it has the hammer. So these actually have the same functioning of single, double, single, double. So when I would say hand ejector, this would be the alternative. The automatic star ejector. Similar to what you would see on a Smith & Wesson. Um, and in all honesty, stolen from the Smith & Wesson. So, I'll throw a couple of rounds in here. Okay, that didn't eject because these are shorter than normal. And the way you would eject these, if you were in the military, you point the gun up, and then you keep the gun pointed up, and you rotate that way. So a lot of people who complain about these things not ejecting properly or shells getting stuck, you're not doing it properly. Plain and simple. It's not the pistol, it's you. Alright, there's my little rant for this video, I think. So we'll go back to this and I'll show you this one. The shells go in. The shells come out. And, but that actually is an interesting thing just happens here. This is what happens when you don't tilt the pistol backwards. You end up getting shells stuck under the ejector and now there's zero way to close this thing. You're going to have to manually get them out at that point poking them out hopefully they'll drop out so that's the function of the ejector versus hand ejector and that's also um, an example of what 
this spot this is supposed to fill. So who would be carrying these things? Um, these are backup pistols. Uh, in a true sense, they would have been given to truck drivers, machine gun crews. Um, more popular, um, especially in World War II and going into Vietnam, aviators, U.S. aviators loved these things simply because they were lightweight, much lighter than the 1911, much smaller than the 1911. And everyone kind of know that if you're shot down, you don't need a massive caliber because survival... Um, you're not going to shoot your way out with a handgun if you're being captured by the Germans. The handgun will maybe, you know, get you away from one guy or two guys and hopefully get you something to eat if you're starving. But that pretty much is the extent of, of what an aviator would use this pistol for. Survival, not warfare. All right, backing up a bit here. So I was saying you might know this as the Model 10, but realistically uh, that... Um, way of identifying it is, is retroactive. It wasn't until 1957 that Smith & Wesson started giving number designations to the pistols. So this was never called a Model 10. Uh, it was retroactively named a Model 10. So if anyone wants to play the, the, the I'm better than you, you're better than them now. You know the truth. So these were available in quite a few different lengths. Um, you can get them all the way down to 2 inch, 4, 5, 6, and 6.5. Six and like I said, this is a 5 inch one, so it gives you an idea of what you're looking at. This is a mid-length, I would call it. There was minor changes throughout its production, and I would say the biggest one to keep in mind about this pistol when it comes to um, actually firing them, if you have them, uh, if you have one built before World War II, do not use smokeless rounds in it. You could probably get away with it um, if you're using like a 38 Smith & Wesson, which is actually what this is designed for. So a 38 Smith & Wesson is just a shorter version of a 38 Special. I unfortunately don't have a 38 Special shell with me on hand, but you get anyone who's, who's you know, that's a 38 Snap, and that's about the size of a 38 Smith & Wesson. Um, you can see it doesn't fully fill the chamber. Um, a 38 Special would be about the full length of this chamber. They, some of them were made for that, uh, most of them weren't. So going back to firing this thing, um, if you have one from World War II, it's a black powder gun. Uh, any gun before 1910, you can pretty much call it a black powder gun. It was never fully meant to fire um, smoke as less rounds. Um, they may be tough enough, and they may have been... So there's always exceptions to the rules where they have retroactively allowed you to use uh, smokeless rounds, but... Um, stay on the safe side. If you are going to push your luck, don't go above a 38 Smith & Wesson. If you put a 38 Special in here, um, these Victory models weren't designed for that. Some built for the American military were, but be very cautious. Um, that's all I have to say. These are not um, really tough guns. Uh, the, the prime example being before World War II is these cylinders here were not heat treated until... Um, I get you the exact number here. Till serial number 31,600 sorry, 31, 30, bleh, how do I say it? 316,648. So keep that number in mind, guys. That's that's the number. Anything below that, these are not heat treated, which means they are soft. And if you're going to have a malfunction uh, firing from one of these things, it's probably going to be the cylinder if it's not heat treated. Uh, the barrels were probably heat treated, so the barrels most likely are going to hold up. The other thing I found is you just beat the heck out of these things when you fire um, smokeless rounds. If they don't explode, you're doing damage to them. Victory models, uh, as of April 4th, 1942, were standardized with a 5-inch barrel. So that's the that's the, the cutoff date for the 5-inch barrels. Pretty close to the end of its era, but... Uh, so they're saying the, the main identifying feature would be the lanyard loop and of course the serial number the lanyard loop is cool um, I wouldn't say that's the defining feature um, a lot of people have these removed uh, I don't know why in the US they love taking their, their lanyard loops off but you guys do so hey that's your thing like I was saying during World War II 590,000 of these things were built which is uh, a pretty good number <laughs> to say the least 597,305 uh, majority were sent to the UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa under the Lend-Lease program. And that's exactly what this one is. I can't tell you whether or not it just came here to Canada or if it was um, came from Britain. Uh, there was a lot, of, a lot of these left over at the end of the war and they were passed around. Um, one of the neat little factors about these guys here, you can see it right there. Made in 
USA has the cartridge there. So going on to the going back to the cartridge a bit, we were talking about the 38 Smith and Wesson. Well, technically these weren't designed for the 38 Smith and Wesson. They were actually designed for the 38 200, um, which is based off the Smith and Wesson round. But 38 is the caliber, 200 is the grain of the bullet. Um, and the speed on those was 620 feet per second and 176 foot pound um, of energy. Or if you're British, 300, uh, 239 joules or 190 meters per second. So not a fast bullet, not a, um, the 200 grains is, is a pretty heavy bullet. But what ended up happening is they found during testing that those bullets tended to tumble out of the pistol. Uh, and I can tell you, uh, even the 38s you fire nowadays, Smith & Wesson still tumble out of these pistols. But the problem with that one, um, according to the rule of uh, war, is that would be considered an expanding bullet. So those are outlawed. And it'd be a war crime to use them. So they thought, better safe than sorry, we'll, we'll lighten up the bullet, which is what they did. Um, these ones have not been modified. Uh, the sights will be a little bit different. I'm not going to go into too, too much detail because you actually have to get them out and measure them. You can't just look at them and say, oh, that's blah, 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 blah. All right, going back to that. So the 38200 was actually introduced in 1877. So that's an old pistol. Um, the other aspect of these two is uh, the OSS uh, handed these guys out to resistance groups um, all throughout World War II, not just in France. Everyone thinks of the French resistance. Uh, yeah, they got a lot of these, but there were any anywhere you had a resistance group, they'd be airdropping these things and handing them out like candy. So they're common that way. I don't know if there'd be changes in markings or they all would have said made in the USA, which is, I guess, all out war. It doesn't really matter where things are made if you get caught. So initially there was 65,000 of these with the four-inch barrel. So if you have a four-inch barrel, you're, you got a nice little uh, rare one there. Um, but there was quality issues with the early ones. So 1942, the U.S. Um, Ordnance Board stepped into Smith and Wesson and put government officials in there to actually inspect these guys to make sure that they're um, being manufactured to the proper standards uh, of the time. So, kind of a mark on on Smith and Wesson's history, I would say. But hey, they still exist, so they can't be that bad, can they? Um, the other thing they did in 1945 was they modified the the firing block, so the the safety. What ended up happening was there was a sailor, um, I don't know if he was a naval avi aviator, but he was in the Navy, and uh, I believe he was an aviator, and his pistol fell out of his holster, hit the steel deck of the ship he was on, and discharged, killing the sailor. Um, that one incident was enough for them to say, oh, one and done, uh, they're going to change the design, which they did, so uh, nothing to keep in mind. Um, pre-1945, like I said, these weren't manufactured much past 1945, at least not as the victory model. So pre-1945, they're not exactly drop safe, so nothing to keep in mind if you own one of these. But uh, I would say no pistol is drop safe, so don't drop your pistols. Uh, accidents happen, I guess that's the lesson. Uh, but I believe there's no such thing as accident. Uh, it's kind of like an accidental discharge. Does it really exist, or is it negligent? I believe it's negligent. Going a little bit onto the history after World War II. These things were quite impressive how long they've stayed in service. Um, I mean, the 1911 kind of seems obvious. It's a self-loading pistol, a semi-automatic, so it has a lot in common with modern uh, firearms even today. Uh, Olvers are definitely antiquated. Uh, I know there's a lot of proponents out there. I'm not saying they're bad. I'm just saying compared to a semi-automatic pistol, they, they don't quite hold up uh, when it comes to combat. So this, I was saying, uh, was popular among aviators. So that goes all the way through up into Vietnam. And in Vietnam, these became even more important because your big old chunky 1911s, that's, yeah, here we go. Big old chunky 1911 here. You can see the size difference and the weight difference is even more significant. Um, in Vietnam, that's when you really started seeing ejector seats coming into play. And the ejector seats, uh, were rocket powered. They're not like the modern injector seats, which are still really violent, but they were incredibly violent back in the day. So any weight, like in this guy here, 
um, had a tendency to potentially even kill the pilot. So the lighter the pistol, the better. That's when you start seeing a lot of the more advanced Smith & Wessons with the titanium and aluminum and duranium and all those kind of things come out to, loose, uh, to lighten up the pistol. It's not for comfort. It's for survivability during ejection. So up into Vietnam, uh, I believe you can see one of these in Flight of the Intruder, which is a great uh, movie if you haven't seen it. It's a 1980s William Dafoe spot on perfect movie. Hilarious too. Um, the, what, the part that surprised me during my my um, research was these actually went all the way to Desert Storm. They were used with the Air National Guard and transport crews. Um, that's in the 90s, 1991. So, wow. That's all I have to say. Wow. Like, um, I, I think I'd be a little upset if I got one of these instead of an M9 or, or a 1911. Uh, but hopefully you never have to use them. That's, I, I guess, the... the positive side they don't think you're gonna get shot at if they give you one of these it's kind of like a encouragement i suppose you can call it uh if you want to see a little more detail lee harvey oswald used a version of these um to kill uh police officer jd Tippett. i have a whole video on the kennedy assassination guns uh not conspiracy theories but if you're interested i highly recommend checking that out it does have an 18 plus rating uh simply because there is i i didn't want to put gore in there but you can't talk about kennedy without some gore slipping in there right so we'll get on to the markings on these all right so the first and biggest and obvious is going to be your giant smith and wesson logo moving further down the frame there's the made in usa And on the tells you specifically 38 SNW cartridge. So no mistaking, this is not 38 special. I wouldn't fire 38 special out of this thing. So 38 Smith and Wesson. There's not a lot of markings on this side, as you can see, it's rather plain. So going back. You have your serial number. And you have some really like markings there. I'm honestly not even sure what they'll say. That should be where it says victory. Uh, on the back strap, I do believe this actually might be a New Zealand gun because I don't think I've noticed that before. NZ uh, 1384 is what it says. So this could possibly be from New Zealand. Um, on the barrel, up top it's marked as well a lot of markings on the top smith and wesson springfield mass patent blah 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 september 14th i think 05 it says uh december something 14. anyways so that's the markings uh like i said there's not a ton on these oh i forgot a marking actually Right up there, the coolest marking of all, I forgot. It might be impossible to read, but that says property of the United States. So that's a cool aspect I like of these, the, the whole property of the US is just, I mean, I don't know why they did that, but that was pretty common. One aspect about this is how do you carry this in the, in the British military? This is what you use. This is just the standard uh, P-37, uh, pattern 37. 1937 holster uh, this one's marked 1943 and as you can see it fits perfectly the cool thing about this holster that i like is it will fit anything here's the end field fits the end field i don't have a webley on hand at this exact moment but it will fit a webley and yes canada we did use 1911s this is not a canadian 1911 but it is a colt 1911 built in 1915 you see fits that perfectly so it's kind of like a one size fits all holster which is pretty amazing pretty amazing i think so i like these holsters they're getting incredibly expensive uh, there are reproductions out there so be careful uh, i didn't even know until recently and luckily the person i was about to buy it off of said hey you know that's reproduction i said no i'm canadian we don't reproduce those so anyways everywhere else in the world getting hard to find even canada they're over a hundred dollars a holster now they used to be twenty dollars a holster so if you see these guys, grab them. 
put them online, sell them, make some money, guys, if people want them. Alright guys, I hope you enjoyed that video. I need more subscribers. So, please like, subscribe, and if you know anybody who's even into this stuff, please let them know. Um, word of mouth, I think, is probably the best way. Whenever I worked at companies, um, we never advertised. We always relied on word of mouth. So, uh, please spread the word. If you like this stuff or you know somebody who does, uh, let them know. And uh, more subscribers, the merrier. The more subscribers, the more videos. Uh, and the more subscribers, the more in-depth and advanced videos we'll get. So, Hope you guys enjoyed this. Please like, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.